Hello, and welcome to the first in a three-part series where we plan to educate and celebrate Juneteenth. I'm Ernest Jenkins, Vice President with Cigna in South Florida, and I'm excited to be here with you this year. The Urban League of Broward County and Cigna are celebrating African-American culture with a focus on the importance of Juneteenth by sharing perspectives on one, our past, the history of how we got to this point, two, our present state, sharing a realistic view of today, and then three, our future, how we can take part in actually shaping it. So thank you again for joining us as we celebrate this monumental event and meet the staff at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center located in Broward County. I would first like to introduce you to Makiba Foster. She is the Regional Manager of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. Makiba, take it away. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I am Makiba Foster. I am the manager of the African American Research Library and Culture Center, and it is a pleasure to be with you, um, joining some Dynamo partners in the community, Cigna South Florida, as well as the Urban League of Broward County, to talk to you about Juneteenth and much more understanding emancipation celebrations from Juneteenth and all the other celebrations that happen around the world as it relates to freedom celebration. So today our team will highlight the work that we do by sharing with the audience the importance of Juneteenth and other Freedom Day celebrations um, that are rooted deeply within the African-American community and throughout the Black diaspora. And so today our team will, will talk about um, some of the history um, and some of the, the celebrations and why Juneteenth is an important historical holiday within American history and black culture. And so what I want to do today is actually before they talk about Juneteenth, I want to share a little bit about our uh, library and cultural center located in the uh, historic uh, district of Cistrunk community. Um, actually, our partners and neighbors are the Urban League of Broward County and so Juneteenth and much more understanding the history and the importance of emancipation celebration. So not only do we celebrate Juneteenth in South Florida, but we also celebrate the 20th of May and emancipation in Florida. So you'll learn a little bit more about that. But the team at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center are very proud and happy to share uh, some of this history and work. We've been doing this work for a while, and now we are happy to see and understand that a larger audience is paying attention to some of this, this, this historical kind of celebration, um, like I said, rooted in American history and culture. So I want to tell you a little bit about the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. So the African American Research Library and Cultural Center is a 60,000 square foot facility. It is a multi-purpose facility. Um, and this year we're, we're prepping to move into a wonderful celebration next year of our 20th anniversary. We opened in 2002, um, which with much fanfare um, and community support, where we our work is that we center the lives of black people from across the diaspora. Um, uniquely because South Florida has this convergence of, of the Black diaspora from the Caribbean, from, from the continent of Africa, um, the African-American story. We have all of these, these places of intersection where people, not just Black people, can come and understand and learn about our facility. Our facility is a library, it is a archive, and it is a cultural center. And so I want to talk a little bit about those things that make up the library, the archive, and the cultural center. The library. So what makes us unique is that we have a two specific collections um, in terms of a sex circulating library. We have our youth services a collection, um, and this is the collection that you see with the the, the fun uh, adinkra symbols and the crayons hanging in the air. Um, we service uh, children throughout the community um, as well as schools um, and mainly for our circulating collection, both for youth and the adult services that you see on the screen as well is that our, our work is to um, 
collect content uh, related to the Black diaspora. So there's a book out there that you're interested in and understanding and wanting maybe some more diverse children's literature. Um, we are the, the library that you can find those things in. And so our next part of the African American Research Library and Cultural Center is our archive. So the archive, our special collections and archives department um, has a wealth of material. Um, this is what makes us also very unique as opposed to just your run of the mill library. We are a research institution. So original research and scholarship can be produced out of this content. So if someone did want to come in and do some original research about Juneteenth and, and its history and understanding its impact and legacy, our place would be one of those locations that you could start doing that kind of research. And so our archive includes rare books, which you see on the screen, as well as um, manuscript collections and, um, and, and artifacts and art. And so one of our proud uh, uh, pieces that we like to show off is our Esther Roll collection. Um, Esther Roll was a local woman from Broward County and um, well known for her role as Florida Evans. You can see her Emmy is featured in, in one of the pictures, but her, her archive is housed here with us at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. Um, the book that you see is a book by um, the famous black poet Paul Dorrance Dunbar signed by him in 1887. I believe that that says 1887. So finally, we have a cultural center that we are very proud of. And our cultural center consists of a 300 seat theater, as well as our 5,000 square foot museum space. And so the museum space hosts uh, exhibitions and, and um, all the, the, the things that, that go into making great uh, museum experiences. Um, and so you see an image of our current exhibition that's just, uh, that's been uh, very well received, The Porch is a Tree is a Watering Hole, which features um, the story of the, lo the neighborhood that we are located in, the Sistrunk community named after Dr. James Sistrunk, one of the pioneers and uh, physicians of, of the Black Broward community, uh, which eventually became uh, named after him. Um, and so that is our cultural center and our theater um, can produce uh, uh, award-winning plays and we bring on performances and all of those things um, that uh, also balance out the, the education part, but also the entertainment part. So we do a bit, a, bit, a bit of educating and entertaining. So we like to call it a little bit of edutainment. And so uh, with that, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about um, the work that my team will, will do today in, in terms of uh, bringing you on the journey or understanding Juneteenth. And so for some of you, Juneteenth, it may be a new experience. You may not have heard of it until probably last year when it really started to um, raise on people's monitors or radars about this holiday. However, this commemoration has been celebrated for over 150 years. And the celebration, like I said, is rooted in African-American traditions, and it is inextricably, it's, it's tied to, to American history. Um, and so I am happy to say that Arlick's very existence is within that same spirit and legacy of those newly freed men and women who wanted to never, never forget their day of emancipation. And so we want, the work that we do is we want people to learn and never forget about this history of human bondage, but also the story of freedom. And so for us at Arlick, we were built uh, to tell the story of a black history. Um, and and, and we, we want to tell the story of slavery, but we want people to understand that the black experience is much more than enslavement. And so, uh, it's important to understand that story, but it's also un important to understand who we were before enslavement, what happened during enslavement, and then what happened after enslavement. And so part of this, this discussion of Juneteenth is understanding the importance and why um, Black people have continued this tradition for so long in terms of celebrating their freedom story. And so today, our approach uh, for this program is to create a more inclusive understanding of American history and, uh, and its impact on our present. And so leading the discussion today is our dynamic team at Arlick. 
we have with us from the adult services uh, section, Dr. Ramona LaRoche, and she will be discussing the history of Juneteenth and other emancipation celebrations. And then we have a fool Ferdinand with our special collections sharing the historical artifacts that can be viewed in our collection. And finally, we have Lisa Jackson with Youth Services uh, section who will share how to engage this, this topic with, with young children. Um, it is something that children need to know. Um, and, and sometimes because the issue of enslavement becomes a bit difficult, uh, we want to give you some tips and tools on how to actually have a conversation about a Juneteenth, the history of it and why it is so important, why people celebrate. So I hope you learned something today. And if you get a chance, the library is open and we would love to see you um, for a visit. So thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. LaRoche. I am so excited to be able to share in this historical narrative with regards to Juneteenth and Emancipation Day. I'm going to share with you today some research that me and my partner did, and um, I think you'll find it as interesting as we found it. So let me begin for a couple of things. Uh, first of all, when we hear about Juneteenth, we often hear that the celebration took place in June. And for a long time, that was the only discussion around the country, really, that they talked about. But of late, and when I say of late, I'd say the last couple of years, it was brought to the attention of the world, but particularly here in South Florida, that Emancipation Day actually took place in Florida on May 20th, 1865. So just to kind of give you a background, if I may, about the counties and the counties that were involved specifically in enslavement, I'd like you to take a look at the map here. And I wanted to tell you a few things. In March 3rd, 1845, Florida and Iowa, free territories, became eligible for statehood. And as such, President Tyler signed the law granting pro-slavery in Florida. By 1860, Florida's population of 140,000 people, of which 44, excuse me, 44% of those people were enslaved. The counties that were involved in particular um, aside from Tallahassee and Leon County, were also Gadsden, Jefferson, Hamilton, and it eventually spread to Alachua and Marion counties. And if you can see the arrows there, that kind of gives you a sense of where the enslaved people were in the beginning. I'm getting next, and my slide is not okay. Okay, sorry, thank you. So Brigadier General McCook um, and the Union Army arrived in Leon County to receive the surrender of the Florida Confederate Army in May, and, and on May 20th, 1865, there was a proclamation. This is actually the notice and it talks specifically with regards to Negroes and how the changing of the status of black persons went from slavery to freedom. The Knott's House in Tallahassee was actually where the proclamation was read. And here on your right, you see the Union soldier reenactors um, as they do a reenactment re every year um, along the Knott's House property. These are just some images of the Emancipation Proclamation. And wanted to just talk a little about some of the ceremonies that took place in Florida. The first anniversary was led by the Freedmen's Benevolent Society with town folks and guests that celebrated this universal freedom with fifes and drums. In 1867, 2,000 former slaves processed to Bulls Pond today known as Lake U of Ella, from the U.S. military camp. And it was led by the Benevolent Society and the Independent Blues. There was a day-long picnic and a political rally. 
And again, in 1871, Reverend Charles Pierce and members of the African Methodist Episcopal Church emancip celebrated Emancipation Day with a party at Bulls Pond. On some occasions, African Americans visited, they came from the East by train. Others came from Monticello and elsewhere throughout the state for picnics, and they continued to celebrate. Um, and since 1871, there's also been a tradition of decorating Union soldiers' graves in the old cemetery as part of the observance. So the celebrations have, excuse me, the celebrations have been taking place all along ever since back then. Here you have some images of African-American workers and tenants celebrating Emancipation Day in 1930 at Horseshoe Plantation. We have some people from Jacksonville in 1922, and also some ladies in front of a decorated car for a parade in St. Augustine. The new freedom was celebrated more than one day each year by the formerly enslaved Black people. Texans did not celebrate the Emancipation Day until June 19th, as it took from January to June for the news of freedom to spread across the United States. The other thing that I'd like to share is that a lot of places around the country do something called a watch night service. It continues to serve as an Emancipation Day celebration for those formerly enslaved, and it recognized that the signing of the Procl Proclamation of Freedom took place by Abraham Lincoln, and it traditionally takes place on New Year's Eve and, New Year and the day. On New Year's Eve, uh, the South Carolina town, coastal town that I'm from, we actually would go to church, and at about 1130, we were celebrating and we have a service, and by about 10 minutes to, to the midnight hour, everyone gets on their knees, and there's a white watch night service man who actually announces the time. So it's a whole ritual where someone says, watchman, what time is it? And then the watchman will say, the time is 1155. And that continues until midnight. And once midnight is struck, everyone prays, gets up and hugs and embraces. And that again, goes back to that celebration of Emancipation Day. Since we also just last month celebrated Memorial Day, I felt it was important, as did my colleague, that we talk about Decoration Day. Decoration Day was an earlier name derived from the ritual of decorating graves, was and it remains a central activity of Memorial Day. But something that's really noteworthy is that in 1865, the first Decoration Day took place in Charleston, South Carolina. Black people were freed from enslavement less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered. There was a racetrack known as the Washington Race Course and Jockey Club. In these late stages of the Civil War, the Confederate Army transformed the formerly posh country club into a makeshift prison for Union captives. More than 260 Union soldiers died from disease and exposure while being in the racetrack's open airfield infield. The bodies were hastily buried in a mass grave behind the Granton stands. Also, in 1868, the first national commemoration of Memorial, Memorial Day took place at Arlington National Cemetery, where both Union and Confederate soldiers are buried. In talking more about that Decoration Day, this is a drawing on your left, the Matars of the race course. And it's actually a drawing depicting where the gate was and where those, those people had been buried in the mass grave. Charleston fell and then Confederate troops evacuated the badly damaged city, but those that were freed from enslavement remained. The emancipated men and women gave fallen Union prisoners a proper burial. They exhumed the mass grave and they reinterred the bodies in a new cemetery with tall whitewash fence inscribed with the matires of the race course. Here you see a picture 
of those people celebrating on that first decoration day there in Charleston. May 1st, 1865, a crowd of 10,000 people, mostly freed slaves with some white missionaries, staged a parade across the racetrack. 3,000 black school children carried bouquets of flowers and sang John Brown's body. Members of the famed 54th Massachusetts and other black union regiments were in attendance and performed double time marches. Black ministers recited verses from the Bible. Later, the old horse track and the country club were torn down. Today, that area is known as Hampton Park. A gift from a wealthy Northern patron provided for the reinterment of the Union soldiers' graves from the humble white fence graveyard in Charleston to the Bu Buford National Cemetery. And that's just another image again of May 20th. But I also want to talk to you a little bit real briefly that that Hampton Park that I just mentioned, uh, several years ago, we actually erected a Denmark VC statue in the center of the park. Um, sadly, I have to say that it was just vandalized last week and it was hammered and destroyed where his name is. So there's an investigation going on now with regards to that. So once again, Emancipation Day, January 4th, 2005, legislation was signed to make Emancipation Day an official public holiday in the District of Columbia. Elsewhere, the emancipation of the enslaved is celebrated in Florida on May 20th, in Puerto Rico, March 22nd, and Texas, June 19th. Similar events in many countries in the Caribbean include Anguilla, Bahamas, Bermuda, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobac and Tobago, and the Turks and the Quesos Islands. Many of these events occur during the first week of August as slavery was abolished in the British Empire on August 1st, 1834. So what's the future of Emancipation Day? Well, the Florida Black Caucus of the local election, election officials are requesting that cities or counties adopt a resolution recognizing May 20th as Florida Emancipation Day. The Tallahassee chapter of the NAACP supports the legislation and recognition of May 20th has also been added to St. Augustine, Jacksonville, Punta Gorda, and Monticello. This year, Orlando Senator Ralph excuse me, Randolph Bracey created a bill to recognize two new legal holidays to celebrate the emancipation in the state. The amendment establishes Juneteenth, Juneteenth Day on June 19th and another legal holiday on May 20th called Emancipation Day. Unfortunately, that bill did not pass this year. So I just want to tell you a bit about our adult services highlights. We offer things like research books and reference services. We have a small business resource and computer technology centers. And we do literacy programming. We do genealogy. We also feature a South Florida book festival. We have an a la con. We have book clubs where we focus with local authors programs as well. And we have Destination Fridays. We are involved with virtual and augmented reality and loads and loads of cultural heritage events and programming, exhibitions, lectures, plays, and so forth. So this is a selected list of some of our library resources. And I'll leave that for a minute, but not more. And then we also have some digital resources available. And with that, I'd like to, again, thank everyone for participating and listening to us. I wanna thank my colleague Pearl Woolridge for us, her assistance in making this presentation possible. And I want to thank my staff and everyone that joined us today. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Afua Ferdinand. Thank you, Dr. LaRoche. My name is Afua Ferdinand. I'm the archivist for Broward County Library Special Collections and Archives. I oversee the archives at the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. Broward County Historical Archives, and the Bienes Museum of the Modern Book. Today, I'll be discussing with you all historical documents and images of emancipation 
commemorations. I'll be pulling from multiple resources, including the National Archives and Records Administration, Florida Memory, the Houston Public Library Digital Archives, and of course, the African American Research Library Archives, which can also be found um, in the Broward County Library Digital Archives webpage. So to begin, as an archivist, I am tasked with preserving materials from multiple um, cities within Broward County um, and in Florida in general, as well as internationally that document the African diaspora. Particularly, we document materials that focus on Broward County residents, particularly Fort Lauderdale. With this document uh, to begin with, I'm discussing the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Abraham Lincoln um, and was issued on September 22nd, 1862. The proclamation declared that all enslaved persons in the Confederate, sta Confederate States of America were free. The proclamation was to be enforced on January 1st, 1863. Now, because Southern states do, did not recognize President Abraham Lincoln as their president and instead recognized Jefferson Davis, they did not enforce these uh, the, the proclamation, and therefore they were slow to emancipate the enslaved people. So the first image I'm showing you is a copy of the uh, is the original action Emancipation Proclamation from the National Archives and Records Administration that was um, written in January 1st, 1863. So to go into more detail of the states that were slow to emancipate including Florida and Texas. Since we are in Florida, I did want to highlight Florida. On May 20th, 1865 at Knott House in Tallahassee, Florida, Union Brigadier General Edward M. McCook announced President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation ending slavery in the state. This occurred, as you can see, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. So Florida's Emancipation Day is commemorated on May 20th. Union Army Major General Gordon Granger proclaimed freedom from slavery in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, through the order of General Order No. 3. Texas was one of the last states to emancipate enslaved peoples before Kentucky and Delaware. Kentucky and Delaware were border states. The image on the right is the General Order No. 3 headquarters, District of Texas, Galveston, which was signed on, which was issued on in Texas on June 19, 1865 by General Granger. June 19th is what is now known as Juneteenth. So here I highlighted some images from the Houston Public Library and the Florida Memory that shows the celebrations of African Americans um, uh, celebrating Juneteenth and their also their respective um, emancipation days. So um, in the bottom left, Corner, we have a picture of a parade. Juneteenth was celebrated with a mixture of parades, cookouts, live shows, dancing, music, lectures. As you can see in the middle, we have a picture of a decorated buggy. Uh, buggies were often decorated, cars as well, and future were decorated. Usually these were used in parades. And then also you can see in the right, a live show with African-American workers and tele uh, tenants celebrating Emancipation Day. This was if this particular image was at the Horseshoe Plantation um, in Florida. Now, to be more specific on what we hold, um, I included a few images from our archives. So the first image um, on the left is a sheet music written by Henry Clay Work in 1863. Henry Clay Work was a songwriter and composer. He was a white man and he was also an abolitionist. And his family was a stop, uh, his family home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So once the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, he wrote, he composed this and uh, wrote the lyrics to uh, Babylon is Fallen. And this song was meant to be sung as a part of a chorus um, in celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation and the hope that um, this event would help to free the enslaved people, peoples throughout the United States. The image on the right is um, a celebration of emancipation, which was held, held years later in 1913. Um, this was uh, this is an, a memento of the Emancipation Proclamation Exposition, 
So this was commemorated in New York City, and it was a week long celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. It included concerts, it included lectures, it included carnivals, it included a food, just a general celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation. It also commemorated and remembered. Uh, freedmen and abolitionists who uh, worked tirelessly in the to help to free enslaved peoples in the United States. And that is the end of my portion of uh, the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to see more from our archives, you can come to Arlette Special Collections, which is on the second floor, and also the Broward County Library Digital Archives, which hosts. Uh, some of the images that I've mentioned today and other parts of our collections. I'd now like to pass uh, the torch to Lisa Jackson from uh, our uh, children's department. Thank you, Afua. My name is Lisa Jackson, and I'm supervisor of youth services here at the African American Research Library and Cultural. Um, I'm glad you came to this presentation. We've got such interesting things to tell you. The African American Research Library and Cultural Center Youth Services section seeks to empower young people by inspiring a lifelong love of reading, art, and libraries, and to meet the educational, recreational reading, and informational needs of young people within a highly diverse public and a welcoming atmosphere. The section also provides access to information, programming, and ideas about Africa and the African diaspora. To the right of the uh, mission statement is an Adinkra symbol, and it's called Niya Omen, which means he who does not know. And it's from the Akan proverb, when he who does not know learns, he gets to know. And this is what we want the children in, um, that come to this library to believe, that they deserve to learn things and they deserve to know things. I did want to talk a little bit about the Adinkra symbols really quickly, because if you come to the facility, you will see this um, motif of Adinkra symbols all throughout the library. Adinkras are visual symbols with historical and philosophical significance, originally printed on cloth, which African royals wore at important cer ceremonies. Saturated with meaning, these symbols have come to symbolize the richness of Akan culture, and serve as a shorthand for communicating deep truths in visual form. As an example, the fact that most universities in Ghana use at least one Adinkra symbol in their logo demonstrates the dignity their use has come to symbolize. This Adinkra here is Dwinaman, and this is the Adinkra that was chosen for this library, and it is very fitting. It is uh, literally means ram, the horns of a ram, and you're looking down on two rams, um, budding heads. It symbolizes humility, strength, wisdom, and learning. Library programs are meant to inspire and are meant to educate. And we highlight several different programs during the year, but our major programs are the annual summer learning program, where you can fend off the summer slide, that decline in reading during the summer that children experience when they're not reading and they're not having lessons. In September, we have the Ashley Bryan Art Series. It's a collection of programs all involving art and literacy. Over the last 17 years, the Arlick Ashley Bryan Art Series has consistently provided programming and outreach targeting Broward County schools, youth, and with the goal of educating and inspiring art appreciation and literacy. The Ashley Bryan Art Series hosts nationally recognized illustrators of African descent at the library and two or more outreach sessions to, to local schools. We have two, we have four um, art magnet schools um, of different ages in our community that are assigned to our library. And it's wonderful because then we get to take the illustrators to those schools and the kids know exactly what they're talking about. So it's a win-win for everyone. 
It's very inspiring for the kids. Additionally, the invited illustrator gives the library an original piece of book art to add to our Ashley Bryan art collection. And you will see those illustrations on the walls of the youth services section the next time you come to visit. And we also, of course, celebrate Kwanzaa, but our wonderful program next year is going to be a taste of Africa. It's a day long celebration of the continent of Africa. This festival offers a regional approach to discovering the rich and varied cultures of Africa. A family friendly event, the taste highlights the main cultures of each region through samples of foods, art, textiles, artifacts, dance and music to evoke the essence of each area. Virtual reality tours of the, of the facility, 3D African artifacts from the virtual Arlick exhibit and tours related to the walking sticks public art installation just outside the building are also planned. Youth services has wonderful services for children. This is the Adinkra symbol called Deng Chem and it means crocodile. It is a symbol of adaptability and cleverness, and it's from the proverb, the crocodile lives in the water, yet it breathes air. Our intent is to provide services that allow our youth to adapt to different situations and their environment in order to succeed. We offer reader's advisory for learning and for um, recreational reading. We have story time fun and other literacy programs like Reader's Theater that strengthen uh, the language and comprehension of our children. We have all, all computers and they're especially for toddlers and preschool children. Our after school help program runs Monday through, fr Monday through Wednesday, three to five p.m. And it's a free drop-in service where we have a person who helps children do finish their homework. And we do all kinds of school tours with fun activities in the end. We're very popular um, during Black History Month, but anytime is a great time to visit the Arlick Youth Services section. Ananse and Tintan means spider web. The spider in Akan folklore, Anansi, is crafty and creative and always outwitting his contemporaries by fair or foul means. Anansi Ntente is a symbol of wisdom, craftiness, creativity, and the complexities of life. Our biggest asset is our collection. The Ashley Bryan Project is an online resource that offers useful information for scholars, students, parents, art aficionados, and those who simply love great children's books also includes video, inter in video interviews, annotated reading lists, digital images of original children's book art, themed book lists, and career guidance. We have one of the biggest and most complete Coretta Scott King Award book collections in the nation. The Coretta Scott King Book Award is given annually to outstanding African-American authors and illustrators of books for children and young adults that demonstrate an appreciation for African-American culture and universal human values. We have a complete children's and young adult fiction and nonfiction book collection with an emphasis on STEM careers, STEM topics, education, a huge folk tales collection, and books in all nonfiction areas that center around the African-American experience. We also have a large collection of African cultures, um, books for children that introduce them to peoples that they have, may have never heard of before. Lastly, we have fun engineering STEM kits that you can check out for three weeks. We want our children exposed to as many new experiences and ideas as possible to encourage intellectual curiosity about them around the world. Now for Juneteenth. The essence of Ju Juneteenth is hope. Hope is universal. Hope is life. 
there are several approaches to teaching this really heavy topic to children. And I found something from Aisha White, who is the director of the Pride program in the School of Education's Office of Child Development at UPIT. And she gives solid advice in her article, How to Talk to Children About Juneteenth. And it's found in the university's, university's online blog, Pitwire. She asserts that Juneteenth gave people freedom, but it also gave them hope, something they had been longing for for a long time. Telling this history lets all who hear it understand how important it, it was for people who had been treating, who had been treated so badly for such a long time to begin to feel a completely different way to feel free. Children up to age five or six should be raised in a healthy, self-conscious environment and have a healthy appreciation for others. And as long as they have that foundation, they will be ready when they hit maybe the first or second grade to learn the real facts about slavery, race, and Juneteenth. You can start talking to them about the importance of Juneteenth at about the age of five or seven. But teaching about Juneteenth means discussing slavery and the issue of race. Author and scholar Beverly Daniel Tatum gave a TED talk called, My Skin, Is My Skin Brown Because I Drank Chocolate Milk? Based on a question her son had asked her. In this talk, she talks about slavery I love her explanation. It's plain, it's simple, it's to the point, and it's very easy for children to understand. And it's a good starting point. And what she says is about slavery, a long time ago, before there were companies, stores and buildings, there were some people who needed to work the land in the United States. There was a need for smart, strong workers and they went to Africa and brought them to the, United, to the United States against their will, which was not okay. They were people, but they were called slaves. These people, those people made them work, but never paid them and they were never allowed to leave the plantation where they worked. It was very unfair, but there was also, they were also really good people who were working to end this institution of slavery, black and white people, and they were eventually successful. The story I described can be told to anyone. However, a white family might need to explain more explicitly what it, that it was white people, for the most part, who enslaved black people. Now we know there were black people who had slaves, but overwhelmingly, Slave owners were white. Let them know this, but also let them know that there were many white people who were allies in the struggle and they wanted to help abolish slavery and that is an abolitionist. It's also important for, for white families to be prepared to answer questions if their children ask why white people enslaved black people. Um, Talk about race and focus on fairness. That topic, fairness, is something that children understand. And once you get them to understand about the fact that it was unfair, they get a, it, it, it becomes a little less confusing and, it, and it's really a human um, problem. Several experts agree that one of the best ways to talk to children about racism is to focus on that, on fairness. And when you talk to them, you would probably be best served to use the power of stories. Am I? Celebrating Juneteenth with children. So once you've gotten through all of the heavy, serious topics of slavery and race and 
the fact that now everyone is free and this is a time to really celebrate and be happy, there are some things that you can do to celebrate. And one thing is to know what the flag is all about. You'll see the flag on the top right-hand side of your screen. The white star on the center of the flag has a dual meaning. For one, it represents Texas, the Lone Star State. It was in Galveston in 1865 where Union soldiers proclaimed the country's last remaining enslaved people that, that under the Emancipation Proclamation issued two whole years earlier, they were finally free. But the star also goes beyond Texas, representing the freedom of African Americans in all 50 states. Then there is the burst around the star, and that is inspired by a nova, a term that astronomers use to mean a new star. On the Juneteenth flag, that represents a new beginning for African Americans of Galvin Galveston and all throughout the land. And then there is the arc between the blue and the red colors. And the arc is the curve that extends the width of the flag and represents a new horizon, the opportunities and promise that lie ahead for Black Americans. Now, the colors red, white, and blue serve as a reminder that enslaved people and their descendants, like me, were and are Americans. Now, there's some things you can do during Juneteenth celebrations and one of the um, things that most people do is they have some sort of huge feast, which is significant because as you probably know, enslaved people weren't fed well, um, and, but they cooked all the food. Well, they celebrate by eating some of the things that they weren't allowed to eat, like red velvet cake. Who doesn't love red velvet cake? And strawberry soda. It was something that was made for the white family, but they were not able to partake in it. And when they celebrated Juneteenth, they ate all of the great foods. There are other things that you can do with your children. You can play games from long ago, like three-legged race and um, all kinds of games like that. You can listen to blues, jazz, and other forms of music, rock and roll, that has its roots in Africans who were here enslaved. Uh, you can have a Mr. and Miss Juneteenth competition. I've seen that. And the girls dress up in beautiful dresses and the boys get dressed up in suits and they choose a Mr. and Miss Juneteenth. You can read poetry from famous African-American poets like Ashley Bryan, or you could tell stories. Books equal the power of stories. And these are three books out of many books there are out for children now on Juneteenth. The first, Freedom Over Me, is by Ashley Bryant. It is a beautiful story of 11 slaves in their lives. And he goes through each uh, enslaved African, their name, how old they are, and they're from small children all the way up to old 75 or 78 year old people, um, and their story as an enslaved person and their story after Emancipation Proclamation. It's a beautiful, beautiful book, beautifully illustrated. Ashley Bryan is our wonderful um, muse here at the African American Research Library and Youth Services as we have his collection of artwork. Then there's Juneteenth for Maisie. It's a, it's a wonderful book that's illustrated by another illustrator who was a part of the Ashley Bryan Art Collection. Floyd Cooper, and all different now, Juneteenth, the first day of freedom, and that's by Angela Johnson, and illustrated by yet another illustrator who has donated a work of art to our collection, E.B. Lewis. I wanna thank you for your time and attention. I want you to celebrate freedom by celebrating Juneteenth. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Makiba and team, for giving us an overview on the history of emancipation and welcoming, welcoming us to visit the African American Research Library and Cultural Center. This was so informative. You know, I consider myself fairly educated on this topic, but I
but I have to admit, I'm sitting here with a page full of notes on things I've learned just now. So again, we appreciate all of you taking time to share with us today. And this wraps up our Celebrating Juneteenth, our first session, The Past. Please join us as we continue our talks on our present and our future. We hope you enjoy learning more as you celebrate Juneteenth with us.